You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to the Options Playbook, the program where we break down cutting-edge option strategies and explain how you can incorporate them into your own portfolio. Whether you're looking to grow your capital with some offensive maneuvers or protect your investments with defensive plays, you can find them all in the Options Playbook. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA, and SIPC. Now, let's open the playbook and get started. All right, everybody. That music can mean only one thing. It is time once again for Options Playbook Radio, the program where we break down the sometimes impenetrable world of options into some offensive and some defensive plays that you can utilize in your own portfolios. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network. And I am very pleased to be joining Options Playbook Radio on this auspicious occasion, because you see, listeners, it's not just any old episode of OPR. No, 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 listeners. This, this is the 300th episode of Options Playbook Radio, a milestone few programs in the history of time, let alone podcasting, have ever reached. So it's a substantial milestone and one worthy of celebration, which is why they they drag me out of the studio here. To come on the program and celebrate it. And, you know, it wouldn't be right if I was just here celebrating by myself. That would make no sense. No, I have to welcome on the regular host, the guy who deserves all the kudos for putting together those 300 episodes. The options guy himself, Mr. Brian Overby, the senior options analyst over there at Ally Invest. Brian, welcome back to your own program on your 300th episode, sir. Congratulations. Well, thank you, Mark. And I'll tell you, if I wasn't excited before we got on the call, I am definitely excited after that introduction. I can't wait to get rocking and rolling. And I know that we're going to take some time. Uh, We've had a plethora of emails that have came in on listener questions. And a few of them are even asking us to do this more often. So uh, we're going to make this an extra long version of the huddle. And we're going to answer as many questions as we possibly can on this 300th episode. We've cherry picked some of the best ones out there. And I'm really excited, excited to get started. It and basically, let's huddle up. It's time to huddle up and answer questions about your favorite options plays. Submit your questions via twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or questions at the options insider.com. 300th episode spectacular, a listener question palooza. I don't know, Brian. I'm excited. Sounds like our special studio audience here is excited as well. You hear that, Brian? The folks are excited. The crowd, the crowd is excited. Ooh, they're getting really excited. Ooh, look at that. Wow. See, look. 300th, 300th episode spectacular. It brings out the people. They're all excited, Brian. You ready to get going? 
Yeah, that sounds like uh, uh, Cubs bleachers crowd right yeah. there, I got to admit. Yeah, they're getting rowdy. Luckily, we got to them early. If it was a few hours later in the day on a Friday, we, we don't know. We might get a little bit different crowd. So let's get rowing before they get unruly out here. <laughs> All right, first up. You know, Brian, it seems like if there's been one theme to the entirety of Options Playbook Radio, I, I've teased you about it a bit, but the listeners have certainly grokked onto this trend as well, sending in their suggestions. It is the naming around your favorite strategy, the fig leaf. It is a contentious issue. People have their own suggestions. They've sent in many over the course of these 300 episodes. Now we can add Mark Briggs to the list of listeners who also have suggestions. Mark Briggs wrote in saying, instead of calling a synthetic covered call, which is also a contentious name in and of itself for that strategy, instead of calling a synthetic covered call the fig leaf, You guys should push to name it the Speedo. (laughs) Same logic. You're kind of covered, but not really. What do you think, Brian, with the Speedo? You on board with that? I kind of like the the oldness of the fig leaf that has been around a lot longer than the Speedo. But I do appreciate the the email overall. And, I mean, one of the things that, that is really true is this is one of the strategies that a lot of people talk about. And, and, and it makes sense. You know, you're looking at expensive underlying stocks, and you're trying to buy something that's a surrogate to the stock. Where The example that we talk about in the fig leaf or the leverage covered call, or the synthetic cover call, which is probably, I think, the name I, I, I dislike the most, is uh, the fact that you are buying something that acts like the stock, but it's not the stock. It's basically you're looking at like an 80 delta call option. And so that means if it wanted to act like stock, you need 100 delta, right? You need to go way deep in the money. You basically need to replace it with stock. So I, I love the fact that we did this inside the options playbook. It was a goal of mine. And honestly, I can't take 100% of the uh, accolades for the name that we came up with because we actually, at that point in time, we reached out to our trader community and it was a situation suggestion from someone else inside the community. I think it was I think I still recall the community name of Weird Uncle Jesse. I think that was the, the <laughs> username that actually kind of made that suggestion. So that even just adds to the or to the uh, uh, whole story of where the fig leaf came from. But it is probably now, now we have a name for it, so I should say that, but out of all my years of trading and uh, uh, teaching options, which is going on 35 years now, uh, that strategy, everybody would talk about it, but there was never a name. So I'm really happy that we came up with the fig leaf, I have to admit, and the tagline, it's because you're kind of covered. Um, I like the alternative. I guess that would be maybe the we're in the new year, 2020, the Speedo. But I just don't think it rolls off the tongue much like the fig leaf does. Plus, you got branding issues. You know, Ally might not want to invest in in the trademark licensing <laughs> to get Speedo. There's other issues there. Plus, at the end of the day, who are we to argue with Weird Uncle Jesse, right? Yeah, that's very true with Weird Uncle Jesse. And then on top of it, yeah, you think of the marketing. You know what? What kind of type of picture do we have to put in? And I'm not. I, I see that already hurt hurt my head thinking about uh, what the speedo would look like and the graphics around it. <laughs> of course, it might resonate with a certain, let's say, Brazilian or Southern European clientele, perhaps, <laughs> where maybe different different geographic audiences. You change the name up. There we go. That was that was by far the the, the best question to kick off the 300. Episode <laughs> yes, with. it was. It was appropriate. It's appropriate. Once I saw. That, I was like, yep. that's that's gotta that's gotta lead us off because that's been a point of contention for 300 episodes and i have a feeling we've not heard the last of these suggestions for for that strategy oh that's a good one all right next up i like the weird uncle weird uncle jesse that's good all right next up we've got paul m paulino i just like that name sounds like a, sounds like straight out of the sopranos or something double Polly. double Polly here wants to know hello well hello double Polly. What is the option strategy I can take if the call option I bought does not go as projected? That is, the stock price goes down instead of going up. Other than selling to close the call option, is there another action I can take to avoid the loss? And when can I hear your answer? Thank you, Paul. Well, Paul, sounds like you were in a bit of a hurry. You sent this in a while ago, so I made sure you're, we actually answered your question on another program because... Want to make sure people don't have to wait if they can't wait for the somewhat infrequent huddle episodes that we do on the show. But I also want to make sure, in case this is your the one your main one you listen to, that you get your answer here as well. And it's also informative for everyone else. So, Brian, it sounds like a double poly here. He's taking a hit on his calls, but for whatever reason, he doesn't say why. Maybe tax reasons, maybe he's just averse to 
taken the loss. He doesn't want to close out the call option. What other recommendations do you have for him, sir? All right. Well, the, the, this is a loaded question overall because it depends so much on the expiration that you're buying. So to start with, if I'm buying options, specifically even, especially I should say, out of the money options, I want to err as to having too much time as opposed to not enough. You go out farther in time on out of the money options, same strike line, you usually get more delta first of all with it, and then you just don't battle that time decay issue as much. So with that said, if you've done this trade and you do have some time remaining, yeah, there are some things that you can do. One of the simplest things that that you can do is just sell a call and leg into a call spread. So for example, I'm going to, and this is why I say this is a loaded question, because you really need to know the scenario to try to come up with what might be the best solution. I'm going to give you the simplest solution, but I'm also going to talk about one of my favorite strategies that I like to roll in and out of, which is a butterfly. So I'll give you, it might be a little bit of a long winded answer, but we got a long show today. So um, if I look at, I'm long a call option, it's moved against me. I do have some time remaining. Um, I, let's say I am long the 50 strike call option and the stock is now down. I'm going to say, I'm going to make it, you know, 10% out of the money. We're going to say 45 in this instance. If I have enough time left, I might still have some time premium. One of the things that I could do is maybe sell the 52 and a half strike call, or if they got one point strikes, let's say a 52 strike call. Now, by doing that, I am reducing my cost. Now, obviously, that that call option has to be worth selling. That has to have something in it. But now I'm just saying, okay, I think the market's going to come back. I do think that it could get back to at least that 52 level. So I'm going to sell. I'm going to take as much premium in to help offset the actual initial cost of buying that option contract to start with. So that's one of the simplest things. So now I could do that, and I'm selling a strike above the current strike price. That means that I do want the market to go to my strike, my, my long option contract and beyond. Now, another solution is to come on in and actually just get short. Uh, I was wrong. It's broken through support on the downside. Now let's go in and sell the 48 strike call and just see, okay, if I do this, now I'm neutral to bearish on that underlying. And once again, you can't do this unless you have some time premium left, unless you bought far enough out on the initial option contract, this isn't really feasible. So now the last thing that we can do, and this one, I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk about strikes because it's going to get really convoluted. I'm already mentioned too many strikes as it is, but you can roll in and out of butterflies. Um, I like the concept. I, I, and I've done, talked about it on Options Playbook Radio in one of the 300 episodes about it, starting out specifically with a long call spread and rolling that into a butterfly or a long put spread and rolling that into a butterfly. But you can do it with individual call options. You just look at, okay, well, now I've, I'm long an option contract. Well, let's sell two and buy one, and hopefully I can bring that in for a net credit. And that will give me some time because one of the biggest things about a butterfly is if you're correct on your forecast and the market starts coming back and the market starts coming towards me, uh, the correct direction, a uh, butterfly would rather have you be correct closer to the expiration as opposed to, bef- uh, as opposed to having it happen right away. If I'm long a call option, I need it to move right away. If I'm long a butterfly and I'm correct, I want it to move closer to the expiration date because I'm selling two option contracts that I need to basically get some time premium on them. Okay, so now with that said, if you want to go back and look through the episodes, I don't know the exact episode that that I've talked about, but I have talked about this hedging strategy more than once. Um, Now, lastly, on this topic, I also don't want to over-adjust. If you're looking at all these different types of adjustments, um, I'm going to maybe make one adjustment, and that's it. Because a lot of people, I think, err to the side of making too many adjustments. In other words, I don't think the surgeon needs to make five or six different cuts to try to save you on the operating table, right? One cut is enough, and and, and that, and that should be it. Um, so I think when I'm doing these things, I worry about people always thinking, oh, I got to trade, I got to trade, I got to do this. A lot of times the best answer is just to sell it and get out of the position. Um, all right. So that, that was a, a tough scenario because 
you need specific events. And that's part of the reason why, like even inside the, inside the options playbook, it's hard to write about these things because you're never going to have the exact scenario that you're looking at. But think of this. So let's summarize this, my long-windedness. If I'm long an option contract, think about rolling into a long spread or rolling into a short spread to start with. And if you want to get really fancy, the third solution is to look at butterflies and look at them as, I don't want the cheese anymore, just let me out of the trap. Because most of the time when you're doing a hedge, you're just hoping that it comes back a little bit and you can basically get your money back and move on to the next trade. All right. I don't know if you can add any fodder to that, uh, Mark, but gee, I think I'm going to have to take a drink of water because that was pretty long-winded. Oh, the, the crowd liked that one, Brian. Well done. You, you, you're pleasing the crowd. You're keeping them. You know, sometimes it's a game of holding the crowd's attention, keeping them engaged, and you certainly sounds like you're doing. You know, I'm always leery when I see a question like this because they don't explain their reasoning for why they don't want to sell the, the call option. You know, sometimes... You have to take the hit. That's just at the end of the day. You, when you put on, let's say you're just buying a straight up naked call. Sounds like he is a buy itself, no spread, no nothing to offset that premium. You should have a plan at the outset of when you're going to close that. And if it goes against you, you should close it. So, I mean, he didn't provide any other reasoning why. I mean, your your explanation was great. I think that was good. But I'm always a little a little nervous, a little suspicious when I see a question like this. It sounds like someone's looking for a justification to not probably close out a position. He maybe should consider closing. So at the end of the day, it doesn't sound like you want to, but uh, at the end of the day, sometimes closing is your best friend. You live to fight another day, take what, take what lumps you have to, keep what's left of the position, use that to trade again. All right, next up, Indiana guy. <laughs> I like the handle, Indiana guy. Indiana guy wants to know, does Brian put on all the trades that he discusses on the show. Fun program. Well, thank you. Thank you for that love, Indiana guy. Brian, a little bit of a behind-the-scenes kind of question. They want to know when you're, when you're coming up with all these trades here, and you come up with a lot of them here on OPR. Are these things you're doing? In, I think you mentioned a lot of them. These are kind of for educational purposes, and you're doing them in a paper account. So I think that, that kind of sets it up for most people. But if you want to give any clarification to Indiana guy and anyone else out there who's curious all right, so this is definitely a compliance uh, compliance question that I have to be careful with if I if I'm doing uh, addressing this type of thing. As we do say on Options Playbook Radio, that uh, when we're looking at all of these type of trades, they're just meant to be learning, and and that's very true because. First of all, in Options Playbook Radio, if I just talked about the one, like buying calls every single time, we basically wouldn't have a show. So we specifically look for underlyings that would apply to the strategy, and it's really meant to be more so for learning. So it, I very rarely, I, I, I'm going to say basically never put on the exact same trade that I talk about on Options Playbook Radio. And I'm going to, the reason why, it's not that I wouldn't do the concept of it, but the reason why is the conflict of interest. I don't want to be looking at these trades and say they're not meant to be a recommendation and that I'm putting them on uh, and then go ahead and just put that, that trade on by myself. So do I do trades that are very similar to options playbook radio? And I'd say definitely, without a doubt. And how many of the trades I do? Every single one that I put on on the show, I've actually done in my own personal account in some way, shape, or form. Um, skip strike butterflies on Amazon around earnings, definitely. Um, uh, regular butterflies on Amazon around earnings, right? Th these are scenarios where those type of trades are really interesting. Uh, long straddles on Boeing, uh, yeah, Boeing had the that was probably it was kind of weird in that that was probably the best underlying to look at a long straddle line in a long time because you the only the only issue is that it was a fairly expensive underlying. Overall, so that means that the option contracts are expensive, but you just have something where you just gets blindsided by news events left and right, and that premium is just not baked into the option contracts. So that's what our goal is more so on Options Playbook Radio, is to find scenarios where things like a long straddle may work. I very rarely talk about them, but we just happen to have an underlying that it was interesting in. And uh, overall, so my, my, my best answer and very truthful answer is because of compliance issues, I, will, there, there's, I just really cannot do the exact same trades that we're talking about. 
overall. So uh, back to you, Mark, I guess. No, that makes total sense. You know, you're out here at the end of the day to educate and inform people and, and show them different ideas, give them different ideas for ways they can trade. And a lot of times when you're hosting the show, the markets are closed. You say that on the show, the markets are closed. You're kind of taking midpoints. These aren't precise numbers of, you know, for trade we're even giving you. It's kind of just midpoints or hitting bids, lifting offers, you know. So it'd be hard for him to replicate that exact trade, even if he wanted to. Good question, though, about how the show works here. Next up, Tel8HJE wants to know, why aren't there free commissions on options? Just 65 cents for every contract. You know, the notion of commissions has been a bit of a contentious one in in the brokerage space of late. We saw a bit of fluidity on that point last year. Schwab kicked it off. You know, it's been a bit of a misnomer. Everyone's saying free commissions as this listener, I won't say their handle again, as their listener points out, they're not free on options. It's mostly for the quote unquote Delta One stuff, the stocks, the ETFs and Things like that that are a little bit more straightforward, those are commission-free. Options, the industry has mostly settled out around $0.65 cents a contract with no ticket charge. Uh, Brian, you're our duly appointed brokerage representative here. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts on how the industry seemed like everyone kind of cemented around that level and why options still have uh, have some fees associated with them? Well, it's just comes down to cost, Uh, the cost to execute an option trade, especially in the indexes, you know, the exchanges still charge free fees and the fees are higher in the options world than they are in the stock world to do an execution. So it's really quite that simple. And uh, here at Ally Invest, we're actually down to 50 cents a contract. We're probably one of the lowest in the industry uh, overall, but I, I, you know, I can't say that a hundred percent without, without raising the compliance concerns again, but yeah, we're, we're one of the lower in the industry, but I don't, foresee, I, I'm actually really happy to see ticket charges go away. And here's a big reason why is that sometimes people like uh, are placing trades and let's say we enter a trade as a spread, they want to exit it as a spread. Why? Because there's a ticket charge and that ticket charge affects the way that you trade because you're looking at the overall cost of the commissions. And I love the fact that the whole industry has just gone to a per contract charge. It's still very minimal relative to, uh, especially in this day and age, man, Gosh, I, when I started in this industry, things like iron condors and butterflies, uh, nobody even knew what they were because there were too many commissions involved to do those type of trades. So literally, the, those transactions just didn't occur. And now we're talking, you know, 35 years ago that I came back in, that I started teaching option contracts. And it's just great to see what has happened overall. I do not see the per contract charge going away anywhere soon. The exchanges would have to change the pricing of options just in general before the brokerage firms would follow. Yes, options at the end of the day, not the same thing as stocks. <laughs> the price differently, executed differently. A lot more going on behind the scenes too in terms of what's involved at a brokerage firm from a platform, from an analytics perspective and everything else from a data perspective certainly than just putting out a platform for stocks. So I don't know if we'll ever see them outside of you know some of your uh, obscure new players Across the board, all fees go away because it is an expensive product at the end of the day to put together. And you mentioned the exchange fees as well there, Brian. So there are some underlying reasons why there are some lingering fees. I didn't know you guys are at 50 cents. That's kind of interesting. And I'm with you about the ticket charge. It was just an, it was an antiquated concept. It was time for the, the way brokers charge to evolve. And I think the ticket charge was a bit of an old concept. Good question there, you of the uh, pronounceable uh, handle here. All right, next up. Old Market. Old Market wants to know, what does the options guy, well, I guess that's you, Brian, what does the options guy think about Bitcoin options? Are there plans to offer them at Ally soon, maybe the new CME contracts? Thanks. Well, Brian, this has kind of been a, a hot button issue of late here in the world of options. I know we here at the Options Insider, certainly our audience, has been waiting ever since both CME and CBOE decided to list futures over two years ago, it seemed like an inevitable outcome that we would eventually get the options. I don't think anyone thought it would take two years, but it did. And now CME finally has options on their futures there. I know you guys don't really do futures at Ally, but it sounds like old market. And I'm kind of curious too, what are your thoughts just in general on the crypto derivative scene, what's going on out there? And then maybe uh, to address his specific question, are there any plans at Ally to maybe uh, offer these in the near future? Uh, yes, okay. So I'll, I'll jump right in. Uh, I'm okay with Bitcoin options. I don't mind that they're happening, but one of the things about it, they're much like VIX options. Uh, the VIX options have seemed to do well, 
And it's probably one of the things that I, I'm surprised at. I used to be on the new products committee for the Chicago Board Option Exchange. And when uh, VIX options were first being discussed, I really didn't think that they would take off the way they did. Um, and it was mainly because they were just had so much volatility premium in them. And, you know, what is the value of the underlying for that expiration? Uh, it was all based off of the future. And there's still a lot of confusion that goes on in the VIX options contracts because of that volatility component. So now they got the VIX of the VIX, which is the volatility of the, the implied volatility of the options inside the implied volatility. You know, they're trying to get a grasp on it. And I love the fact that the VIX options options are still pretty liquid, didn't they? And a lot of people are trading them. But I worry about that same type of thought in, inside Bitcoin options. Where would this volatility be at? How do you play volatility? Anytime you trade options with this volatile of an underlying, you are trading implied volatility as much as you are trading the actual movement of the underlying. Now, as far as Ally is concerned, uh, the last that I've heard, and we haven't actually brought up this discussion, maybe the, the new contracts at the CME will uh, revamp this discussion, but as of right now, we do not trade anything in the Bitcoin realm, and we kind of made that decision to, to not go down that route uh, uh, approximately, I'd say, what, about a year and a half ago. That that concept hasn't changed, so I don't have any uh, any new information to share with our listeners out there. But I do love that old market actually asked this question because in, to me it implies that he actually has an Ally Invest uh, account if he actually knows that we do not offer them. So in general, um, I don't mind that they're out there, but I do think you, you definitely need to be you need to be an advanced trader and understand implied volatility if you're going to trade any option options like this or even the VIX index. They thought that was funny, Brian. You're keeping them uh, occupied. Because I think I heard some nervous laughter in there. There might be some Bitcoin fans in there. I think maybe they were a little bit uh, uncertain about where you're going to go there. So we'll have to see if we can hook them back in with this <laughs> next one here. All right. More just mouthful handles. PLC4. What happened to this Dave or Bob? None of those out there anymore. PLC4 wants to know, is there such a thing as too much hedging? How many puts or how much of my portfolio should I allocate toward this strategy? Brian, we've seen variations on this theme on this program on many other programs on our network over the course of the last, oh, 13 years <laughs> that I've been doing this at least. OPR, not, that, not quite that long. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a common question. Where we are in the market right now, right? We're threatening all-time highs yet again. These are the times when these questions usually start to filter in again. Hey, I'm thinking about maybe hedging, but man, these things are expensive. What should I do? How many of these things should I buy? What percentage? Should it be a percentage of my profits? These are all the kind of different flavors of this question we get all the time. So I'm curious, Brian, what are your thoughts? Is there such a thing, A, as too much hedging? And then B, ELC4 wants to know how many puts or how much of my portfolio should I allocate towards this, uh, this hedging strategy, sir? All right. So uh, loaded question once again. You could do an entire show on this, uh, but I will act, answer the question as succinctly as I can. Uh, is there such a thing as too much hedging? hedging? The answer is yes. Without a doubt, there is too much hedging. Now, if I'm going to approach it, my attitude on hedging, and, and, I, and I address this coming from expirations, right? A lot of people will, let's just talk about the simplest scenario. I'm just going to buy a put on a stock that I own. Apple's up 100% over the last year approximately. Should I buy some Apple puts? No reason. I, I believe that, yes, you, you could use some of those proceeds that you've, some of those profits that you obviously have to protect yourself. That would be a, a real interesting scenario where I would buy some puts to protect myself. All right. Now, how far out in time are we going to go? Should I buy a year-long option? Should I buy a three-month option? And my attitude is, if you're really thinking that you should buy a year-long option contract, then I really think you should just think about selling the stock. Because if you look at the cost to hedge Apple going a year out in time, it's extremely expensive. And you just look at the cost and then you add in the difference between where the stock is at at the strike and the strike price, which is basically the deductible. You're like, well, gosh, you know, I'll just, instead of paying $20 for this option contract, I'll just sell it when it goes down $20, that type of scenario, because that is an alternative. 
So is there too much hedging on just a one-off stock basis? Yes. I think if you're going to be using this type of strategy, you're using it for a specific event. And that event could be as simple as Apple just hit an all-time high. I've done very well on it. I want to make sure that I have some profit. So let's see if it continues on up after you hit this all-time high or if it's going to come back down over the next three or four months. And then if that's the case, then I would buy a one, two, or maximum three-month put uh, to try to hedge my Apple position. That would be an example of how I might approach it. Not meant to be a recommendation, but that's how I might approach it. Now, if you're talking about how many puts should I buy to allocate towards this strategy in a portfolio, so in here, I take this question as we're talking about index options. What index, I have a basket of stocks, can I find an index that kind of looks like my portfolio and how many puts should I buy? Well, there is a formula that is available to try to guesstimate the approximate amount of puts that you should buy relative to that index. And uh, I used to have a blog on it, but my blogs are gone. But uh, I would just basically say either, Mark, maybe you can point them to something on your website, but there is a uh, an actual uh, formula that you can come up based off of the value of the index to try to get as accurate as you can with that strategy. But I'll definitely let you know that it is not an exact science. You know, people always, they want this, Brian. They want this kind of ballpark rule of thumb for how much of their portfolio, I think he actually asked that specifically, how much of his portfolio should he allocate toward this strategy? And after being asked this, this type of question repeatedly over the years and having to analyze it from different perspectives, I've come down in the ballpark. Again, this is just a ballpark, listeners. This is not a die in the wool guideline you have to adhere to. Every portfolio is different. Every scenario is different. But it seems like a decent ballpark estimate for how much you should expect to, to allocate in terms of paying for these types of hedging strategies, you're talking a decent hedge somewhere in the three, maybe a little bit longer, maybe out to six. It might be a little bit too long, but somewhere in that three plus or so month range, decently out of the money puts, let's say in a spy or something like that. You should probably expect to allocate somewhere between two and three percent to a strategy like that. And that seems to be a ballpark number. A lot of people can come down and get behind. Brian, I'm curious, is that a ballpark number you think is realistic or do you think maybe an evolution of that is required? Yeah, I, I do think it's realistic. I, I mean, I look at it as you, you want to look how much would you be willing to lose? And I kind of think of like uh, William J. O'Neill in his book. He say never lose more than five to seven percent on your underlying. OK, so if I'm spending two or three percent on my hedge to make sure that I get out, then I'm going to have a little bit of a deductible. So if I try to get fancy and do the math with it, I, you're, you're right. You don't want to pay much more than 2 or 3% to try to hedge that overall. And there are some fancy things. We talked a little bit on Options Playbook Radio and what some of the episodes about, uh, you know, to stick with the Apple example, <laughs> honestly, uh, to maybe buy in-the-money leaps, sell your stock, buy an in-the-money leap to have a fixated uh, cost on your Apple stock. You have something that represents Apple, acts a little bit like it, but it's not Apple. So if Apple does give up that 100 points that it just uh, just got over the year, you're only going to lose whatever you paid for your call option. So there are some other interesting ways to approach this, but I, I like your number. And honestly, I haven't heard that number before, but I just think if I'm only willing to lose 5 to 10% on something, I got to make sure that I'm not paying too much for my hedge overall to stay within that realm. And I think that I like, I like your thinking there, Mark, in the way that you, you came to that, that yeah. number. I'm just used to the audience. They want a specific number. Right? <laughs> After they ask and they ask and they ask, over right. time, eventually, eventually come out. It seems to be a decent ballpark. And there's ways you can mitigate that, of course, listeners. And go back and listen to the archives of Options Playbook Radio. If you want to learn about that, you want to just buy the put, of course, you can do the put spread. That's going to mitigate your outlay. If you're comfortable buying more at a lower strike level, you can do a ratio put spread, buy one, sell two. Now, of course, you're going to get longer at that leg, but that's that's something you've obviously planned on. You like that level. Now that's mitigating your cost even further. You can go to the upside, sell that covered call against your portfolio as well, where you're comfortable selling the portfolio. So now you have three income legs versus that one long premium leg. That should go a long way to mitigating that two three percent but again these are just ballparks out there but something to uh to consider let's check back in with the studio audience see what they thought about uh, about that one there 
I think they think we're they think we're funny, Brian. I, uh, that's interesting. I, I didn't realize the show was was as humorous as they clearly. Yeah. They clearly well, when do. you look at that and you hear that, you, you obviously anybody talks about hedging. The most of the, you got to get some coffee, right? Because you, it's not an exciting topic to talk about, but it's definitely a big part of the options marketplace. And then also when I when I look at uh, the, you, we were talking about some of the calls, I should just let people know that a couple of the ones that you might want to look at uh, are titled. Uh, pay later puts, and that's kind of that ratio spread that you just mentioned right now. So there's a a few titles in the 300 episodes that actually say pay later puts, and that's an interesting way to look at a strategy to try to lower your cost of your protection overall. Well said, sir. Oh, this 300 episode is spectacular. It's flying by. I could do it for hours. Unfortunately, the realities of our network, (laughs) I have to go talk volatility in a little bit. But before we do that, let's close out the 300th episode spectacular with some love from the listeners. In particular, this comes from Alejandro. Alejandro says, please tell Brian that I love this show. I tune in every week. Excuse me, I tune in each week. I'm learning a lot. I love the trade recommendations as well. Thank you very much. Brian, I've said this before. I'll say it again. You have the most polite audience of any show on my network. People come in, they write in to ask if they can ask questions. They're very polite in there, and they just love you. So uh, what do you say to all the, all the love out there that's been supporting you, Brian, now for 300 episodes? Can you believe it? <laughs> I, like, I say, oh, stop, I'm blushing. But, no, I love it. Give, it, give me more. On this, on, and actually, we're taping this uh, on, a, on a Valentine's Day right now. Uh, we are going to be uh, airing this a little bit later on uh, next week, but right now it's Valentine's Day. So I'm definitely feeling the love from all the listeners out there. And that's part of the reason why we chose to do this for the 300th episode, do another huddle up and answer as many questions as we possibly can. And I think going forward, we're going to try to do this a little bit more because they are very well received. And we can even, we can tell by just looking at the, the number of views and listens uh, inside, uh, inside all the different ways that you can listen to options playbook radio. Well, unfortunately that music, Brian means we've come to the end. Of this epic 300th episode spectacular. Let's see. I think the audience, they did like it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they're on board still, Brian. So they're there. They're there. (laughs) They liked it. We didn't put them to sleep. In fact, they were laughing a lot. Who knew we were so funny? But, Brian, I think we made a decent dent in the mailbag. There's still quite a few more. We can go on for a few more 300th episode spectaculars. Maybe we'll have to do that in the future. But, Brian, if folks want to become a part of the show... Participate maybe in the four. We'll get the question in before four hundred, but the hypothetical four hundred episode spectacular. Just the next time you and I huddle up, or maybe they want to reach out to you in between episodes. I recommend that, listeners. Like sounds like Paulie and others had they had timely things they wanted to get sorted out. Uh, Hit up Brian directly. That's a good way to do it. So Brian, tell them how to do that, and also where they could find uh, the rest of your options playbook content and what else is cooking in the land of allies, sir. A lot of stuff to get to. Oh yes, definitely. So. If you have a topic you'd like us to discuss on the show, and I'd like to get some good feedback here, too, or, or bad feedback, if there is some out there, I, how we can make the program better, please let me know and send it directly to me at theoptionsguy at invest.ally.com. I want to thank everyone for listening and for all the support we've had on Options Playbook Radio. We'll be back at the same time, same place next week. Until then, may all the options you bought finish in the money, and all the ones you sold finish out. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs> 